On the border between Oklahoma and Texas lies the small town of Warica, with a population of about 2,000 residents. It's a typical American provincial town where everyone knows each other and life flows at a measured, unhurried pace. It was here, in a cozy house on the outskirts of town, that the rich family lived, Father Duane, Mother Gail, and their four children, three boys and their only daughter, Heather. The rich couple chose Warica as their home because of its similarity to Elgin, Oklahoma, where they grew up. They believed it was the perfect place to raise children, quiet, safe, with a low crime rate. However, as often happens, the outward tranquility of the small town concealed its dark sides. In Warica, like in many similar towns, teenagers suffered from a lack of entertainment and opportunities for self-realization. This led young people to seek alternative ways to spend their leisure time, often dangerous and destructive. They would gather on the outskirts of town, experiment with alcohol and drugs, and engage in risky activities. This was the atmosphere in the town during the fall of 1996 when this tragic story began, one that would forever change the lives of many local residents and leave a deep mark in the memory of the entire community. At that time, the rich family was going through a difficult period. Duane, who worked as an electrician, had recently suffered a serious injury at work, during a transformer explosion, he sustained severe burns. The man barely survived and needed extensive treatment and skin grafts. Due to his injury, he couldn't work, which significantly impacted the family's financial situation. The entire burden of supporting the family fell on Gail's shoulders, who had to take on additional work to provide for the family and pay for her husband's expensive treatment. In the American healthcare system, medical services are extraordinarily expensive, so every dollar counted. The children also had to take on some household responsibilities, especially Heather, who was the second youngest in the family. Despite their financial difficulties, the riches tried to maintain optimism and support each other. Gail and Duane were loving parents who strived to give their children the best upbringing and education possible. They adhered to traditional family values and tried to instill these in their children. However, as often happens during teenage years, their only daughter began showing signs of rebellion and a desire for independence. The parents paid special attention to Heather, who was born on January 19, 1980. She was the family's favorite, the only girl among brothers. From early childhood, Heather demonstrated remarkable abilities and persistence in her studies, making her parents proud. At Warwick High School, Heather Rich quickly became one of the most popular students. She combined a rare mix of beauty, intelligence, and athletic ability. As an honor student, she consistently demonstrated high academic performance. She was chosen for the cheerleading squad, which added to her popularity among classmates. In her junior year of high school, Heather was nominated for homecoming queen and was voted class favorite. Her natural beauty and energy attracted the attention of many boys. However, behind this external glamour lay serious internal problems. The constant pressure to maintain the image of the perfect girl began to affect Heather's mental state. By eighth grade, she had developed eating disorders, she would induce vomiting in an attempt to maintain a size 2. The situation worsened after her father's injury when additional responsibility for household chores fell on her shoulders. Heather began self-harming, though she carefully concealed this from those around her. She diligently maintained the image of a successful and happy girl, but internally felt increasing pressure. Her perfectionism and desire to meet others' expectations gradually became an unbearable burden. Despite her internal struggles, Heather remained a friendly and caring girl. She had an adventurous spirit and loved fun and new experiences. At 16, she was going through a typical teenage period of rebellion, eager to try everything life had to offer. Unfortunately, this desire for experimentation would later play a fatal role in her destiny. In the summer of 1996, Heather began dating Randy Wood, who was born on July 7, 1979. Their relationship was quite illustrative of the contrasts in their small town. Randy came from one of Warwick's poorest families. He lived with his single mother, they moved frequently, and by fifth grade, 
he had changed schools three times. Their house stood out with its run-down appearance and broken windows. Every day, Randy walked a mile to school. Despite his difficult life, Randy had a calm and polite demeanor. Although many considered him slow and not particularly bright, he was appointed captain of the school football team. Paradoxically, it was these flaws of Randy's that attracted Heather. They spent a lot of time together, driving around town in Randy's grandmother's car, attending church, and talking for hours. While their relationship was close, they maintained certain boundaries. However, at the beginning of the school year, their relationship ended due to rumors. Randy heard that Heather had been skinny dipping at a party and ended their five-month relationship. After this breakup, Heather's behavior began to change dramatically. She started experimenting with methamphetamine, alcohol, and other drugs. The situation worsened when less than a week after breaking up with Randy, one of Heather's friends, 20-year-old Dennis, died by suicide. This event deeply affected the girl, and she continued her self-destructive behavior. On September 27, 1996, an incident occurred that would foreshadow the future tragedy. Heather was caught drinking alcohol with a friend during a football game. For this, she was suspended from school for three days and nearly kicked off the cheerleading squad. Gail and Duane, concerned about their daughter's behavior, even scheduled a therapy appointment for October 3rd. Unfortunately, this meeting would never take place. On the evening of October 2nd, 1996, a serious argument erupted in the rich household between Heather and her mother Gail. The cause was a $300 phone bill that Heather had run up talking to her friends, especially Randy Wood. Given the family's difficult financial situation, such an amount was extremely high. Gail tried to explain to her daughter that the family couldn't afford such expenses, especially considering the high cost of her father's treatment. She wanted to teach Heather to value money and respect others' work. All you do is waste my money. Gail exclaimed during the argument. Duane, though usually calmer in family conflicts, supported his wife this time. Heather took the criticism hard. When emotions had somewhat subsided, she went downstairs to the living room, said goodnight to her father, but demonstratively ignored her mother, showing her resentment. On this tense note, everyone went to their rooms. However, this wasn't just another teenage argument. That evening, Heather had secret plans. She had arranged to meet with Josh Bagwell, whom she had recently started flirting with after breaking up with Randy. Josh was a senior from one of the wealthiest families in town. He lived with his grandmother and grandfather, who spoiled him by giving him everything he wanted. Around midnight, after waiting for her parents to fall asleep, Heather climbed out through her bedroom window. She didn't take any change of clothes or makeup, items she usually never left home without. This would be her last night at home, though she didn't know it yet. Outside, she was met by not only Josh. With him were Randy Wood and 19-year-old Curtis Gamble, a young man with a criminal past whom Heather hadn't known before. They planned to spend the evening in a trailer behind Josh's house, where teenagers regularly gathered to drink alcohol and use drugs. The next morning, October 3rd, Gail began preparing breakfast as usual and calling the children to the table. When Heather didn't come down, her mother initially attributed this to teenage resentment over yesterday's argument. She was sure that Humber would eventually bring her daughter to the kitchen, despite her rebellious mood. However, time passed, and Heather still hadn't appeared. When Gail, losing patience, went up to her daughter's room, she found an empty bed. At that time, Mobile phones weren't yet common, so Heather didn't have one. The worried parents began calling all of their daughter's friends, but no one knew where she might be. Such behavior was completely out of character for Heather. Despite her recent behavioral problems, she had never run away from home before. Moreover, the girl always cared about her appearance and was unlikely to go anywhere for long without a change of clothes and makeup. But all her things remained at home. Gail and Duane immediately drove to the Warka Sheriff's office to report their daughter missing. 
The mother told them about yesterday's argument over the phone bill and how her daughter had refused to acknowledge her fault. The sheriff tried to calm the worried parents, assuring them that the girl had probably just run away from home, as teenagers often do after arguing with their parents. However, law enforcement explained that for an official missing person report, at least 24 hours had to pass without any contact. Since this time hadn't elapsed yet, the police couldn't accept the report and sent the couple home to wait for news from Heather. Disappointed by the police's response, Gail and Gwen decided to start their own search in town. Their worst fears were being confirmed, something had happened to their daughter, and they felt that every lost minute could be critical. Gail began her own investigation by calling Heather's closest friends. First, she contacted 17-year-old Randy Wood. During the conversation, Heather's ex-boyfriend insisted he had no idea about her whereabouts. However, something in his voice alarmed Gail, he spoke like a robot, repeating a rehearsed story, and showed no concern about his former girlfriend's disappearance. Next was a call to Josh Bagwell. His grandmother answered the phone, saying that the boy was resting after last night's party, and she didn't want to disturb him. The woman categorically refused to call her grandson to the phone, mentioning in passing that she was cleaning the trailer in the backyard where the teenagers had held their party. For a week, the parents drove around the entire county searching for any trace of their daughter, but to no avail. When 24 hours had passed, they went back to the police, and this time law enforcement finally joined the search operation. However, no valuable information about the missing schoolgirl emerged. The tragic resolution came when patrol officers examining the area near the Texas border noticed a body in the river. It was half submerged in the muddy water, but people on the bridge spotted it. The unknown victim's skin was covered with a thick layer of dirt, as if deliberately, to make the body harder to discover. When divers pulled the gruesome find to shore, something even more horrific was revealed beneath the layer of dirt. The body had numerous buckshot wounds, indicating point-blank shooting, likely from a shotgun. The face was so mutilated that identifying the deceased at first glance seemed impossible. Since there was only one missing person registered in the area, Heather Rich's parents were called for identification. They were only able to identify their daughter by an engraved ring that her mother had given her. The victim's identity was finally confirmed through dental records, experts found the fixed braces that the schoolgirl had been wearing in the mutilated body. News of the young cheerleader's death instantly spread through town and became the main topic of discussion the next day. Within hours, all local residents knew about the tragedy. Football player Randy Wood also learned about it, coinciding with the annual game where he had been named king of the game for several seasons in a row. Usually, such matches were followed by loud celebrations, but this time there was no mood for festivities. The detectives, taking on the investigation, first spoke with Heather's parents. By that time, Gail had already called many of her daughter's friends and acquaintances. Her suspicions fell on two young men, Heather's ex-boyfriend, 17-year-old Randy Wood, and her current boyfriend Josh Bagwell. During conversations with classmates and other friends of the deceased, investigators got several leads indicating that Josh and Randy had information about the events of that fatal night. Particular attention was drawn to the type of ammunition used in the killing, so-called double buckshot. These powerful shells had excessive killing power for executing a 16-year-old girl. An important breakthrough came when it was discovered that such rare ammunition was sold in only one store in town, Beaver Creek Lumber and Hardware. After checking receipts, police established that Josh Bagwell had purchased them shortly before the murder. According to the seller, Josh wasn't with his best friend Randy, but with someone named Curtis Gamble. Curtis, who was already 19 years old, had a criminal history. Despite his young age, he had already been arrested multiple times and spent most of his conscious life in juvenile detention centers. The young man was completely unstable and had repeatedly caught law enforcement's attention, he had been caught driving drunk, shooting at dogs, horses, and even random passers-by. On October 23, police visited Curtis's house in a neighboring town, even more significant was the fact that just a few kilometers from his house was the very bridge where the mutilated body was found. 
According to his grandmother, Curtis knew this area well and had often visited the bridge since childhood. The investigation focused on three young men, each representing different social strata of the small town. Josh Bagwell was a typical representative of the golden youth. He always drove the coolest cars and wore the most fashionable clothes, displaying his family's wealth. By 17, he had already crashed six cars, and his latest was a white Dodge Stealth. When he was once detained for drunk driving, he arrogantly demanded a lawyer. Randy Wood, on the contrary, came from a poor family, but thanks to his talent and persistence in sports, he gained no less popularity than his wealthy friend. Classmates adored the handsome team captain for his masterful play on the field. He became the best football player not only in school but in the entire town, even gaining popularity among school teams at the state level. Curtis Gamble turned out to be the oldest among those involved in the case, he was already 19. He had a long history of legal troubles and was considered dangerous and unpredictable by local residents. Unlike the other two boys, who had never had problems with the law before and weren't considered aggressive or dangerous. Randy and Josh were inseparable friends and usually spent weekends driving around dirt roads in Josh's car. Girls could often be seen in their company. The boys regularly consumed alcohol and occasionally smoked marijuana. Due to the lack of entertainment venues for youth in town, teenagers simply had nothing else to do, so they entertained themselves however they could. It was known that Heather Rich often spent time in this company. According to a friend, she had also tried weed and alcohol with them, and on the night before her disappearance, she had snuck out to have fun with the popular boys. This news shocked the parents of the 16-year-old honor student, who had no idea their daughter had fallen in with such dangerous company. Detectives decided to talk to Josh and Randy, who were the last to see the murdered schoolgirl. Both boys told the same story about spending the evening playing dominoes and drinking in the trailer behind Josh's house. However, they denied any contact with Heather that evening. Their mechanical, seemingly rehearsed stories and lack of emotion regarding their mutual friend's death only intensified investigator suspicions. The next day, detectives managed to meet with Curtis. He was detained and brought to the sheriff's office in Warica. The interrogation lasted over eight hours, but the suspect said almost nothing, though he agreed to take a polygraph test. However, what proved most valuable was his admission about owning a rather rare weapon, a Mossberg shotgun, notable for its nine-round magazine. When the weapon was seized and ballistic testing ordered, experts officially confirmed that the schoolgirl had been shot with Curtis's shotgun. After being presented with evidence of his involvement in the young cheerleader's murder, the young man gave in. He told police that he had dragged his two friends, Randy and Josh, into this crime, after which he wrote a detailed two-page confession. Three weeks after Heather's death, law enforcement finally had a suspect who confessed to the crime. Considering the probable involvement of other young men, Randy and Josh were also arrested and brought to the station. They were shown Curtis's testimony, where he claimed that he himself initiated the attack on the girl, but Randy was the direct perpetrator. According to Curtis, he handed his shotgun to his friend and ordered him to shoot the innocent victim, while Josh was simply present. However, police were skeptical of this testimony. The football team captain didn't fit the profile of a typical criminal, the young man had never had problems with the law before, he was an exemplary student and successful athlete, popular among his peers. No one had ever spoken badly about him. Only after persistent efforts by police and a second meeting with investigators did Randy finally begin to give testimony. However, he categorically denied his direct involvement in the murder, claiming that Curtis was the shooter and had initiated the attack on Heather, while Josh simply helped him. Josh, for his part, refused to cooperate with law enforcement. Thus, in October 1996, investigators had two confessions that contradicted each other in many aspects. Eventually, investigators concluded that Randy's testimony seemed more truthful, especially since he successfully passed a lie detector test. In February 1998, almost a year and a half after Heather's tragic death, Josh Bagwell's trial began. 
The case had garnered so much attention that there were too many people wanting to get into the courtroom. Eventually, access to the court proceedings was restricted, with both casual spectators and press representatives being barred. The defendant's lawyers resorted to various attempts to justify their clients. In essence, the attorneys tried to tarnish Heather's reputation, portraying her as an alcoholic and promiscuous girl who had allegedly entered into an intimate relationship with Curtis and then began blackmailing him with exposure, forcing the young man to resort to extreme measures. The parents had to defend their daughter's honor and dignity. In reality, the girl was a diligent student, talented athlete, an extremely decent person who simply ended up in the wrong company and encountered a true criminal. At the hearing, unexpectedly for everyone, Curtis returned to his initial version of events, claiming that Josh wasn't involved in the crime at all and didn't even know about the murder plans. Instead, according to Curtis, it was Randy who fired the fatal shot. This testimony deeply affected Randy. Unexpectedly for all, the football team captain made a desperate move, he rejected the plea deal. The young man didn't want his confession to be seen as solely motivated by a desire to save his own skin. Accusing his accomplices right in the courtroom, Randy stated that above all, he wanted to achieve justice for the innocently murdered girl. On February 14, Curtis Gamble was found guilty of conspiracy to commit murder and the intentional commission of this especially serious crime. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with an additional 99 years. Randy would receive life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Josh Badwell also received life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. He was sent to serve his sentence in the same correctional facility as Curtis. In January 2002, the story took an unexpected turn. Curtis and Josh made a bold prison escape attempt, taking advantage of the night darkness. They managed to hide out in Texas for 10 days. A nationwide manhunt was declared. Eventually, the escapees were caught and returned behind bars to continue serving their life sentences. An even stranger twist came when Josh's mother, Teresa, tried to help organize another escape. Her plan involved contacting Curtis's brother, Rick, and smuggling weapons into the prison by posing as Josh's attorney. She also wanted Rick to help her gather firearms, mats, and mobile phones for the escapees. However, when she contacted him, Curtis's brother reported it to the police. After a period of police surveillance, Teresa was arrested and sentenced to 20 years in prison, with 12 years suspended. The Heather Rich case deeply affected the Warka community and became a grim reminder of how quickly life can go wrong. Her death forced many parents to reconsider their approach to raising teenagers and pay more attention to their children's social circles. Special attention was drawn to the story of Heather's friend, Dennis Wayne Goss Jr., whose death from a shotgun blast on September 25, 1996, just a week before Heather's murder, still raises questions. Dennis was friends with Curtis Gamble, and before his death, he told his father that someone was trying to kill him. During their prison escape, Curtis and Josh even stole a .22 caliber pistol and a truck from Dennis's father's house. Curtis knew exactly where the safe keys were kept. Moreover, Dennis's family was on a threat list that Curtis wrote while in prison. The case of Dennis's death remains open to this day. On the railings of the Belknap Bridge, you can still see the inscription, Dawn Not Forgotten. This graffiti became a kind of folk memorial to Heather, a girl who was popular among people and whose life ended too early due to a fatal combination of circumstances and the wrong choice of company. The Heather Rich case left a deep mark on the life of the small town of Warwicka. It exposed problems that are often silenced in similar provincial towns, the lack of organized leisure activities for teenagers, easy access to alcohol and drugs, social inequality that breeds dangerous alliances between privileged youth and criminal elements. The fate of the three young men involved in the murder turned out differently, although they all ended up behind bars. Randy Wood, despite the severity of his sentence, remained in the community's memory as someone who found the courage to confess the truth, risking his own life. His remorse was genuine, 
and even Heather's parents acknowledged this during their personal meeting on a television talk show in May 1998. Curtis Gamble and Josh Bagwell, on the contrary, continued to demonstrate antisocial behavior even in prison. Their escape attempt and subsequent events only confirmed the danger they posed to society. Particularly telling was the story of Josh's mother, who, instead of acknowledging her son's guilt, tried to help him evade punishment through illegal means. The tragedy forced local authorities to revise their policies regarding youth recreation and teenage crime prevention. Controls over alcohol sales to minors were strengthened, and more opportunities for organized youth activities were created. The Heather Rich story became a warning for parents and teenagers about the importance of noticing warning signs early and not ignoring the first signs of risky behavior. Her death showed that even in the quietest towns, deadly dangers can lurk, especially when it comes to careless choice of company and experimentation with alcohol and drugs. Heather's memory lives on not only in the hearts of her family and friends but serves as a reminder of how quickly life can end due to one careless decision. The inscription on Belknap Bridge has become a symbol of this tragedy and a warning to future generations.